Good afternoon and welcome to this edition of the Richard Urban Show. We present news and views from God's point of view today. We're very happy to have Bill Wooten on. He's running for the Supreme Court of Appeals in Division Two. So please introduce yourself. Thank you, Richard. My name is Bill Wooten. I'm a small town lawyer in Beckley and I'm a candidate for Supreme Court of Appeals. Okie doke. So what are the main reasons you're running for the Su Supreme Court of Appeals? Why did you decide at this time to run? Well, primarily I'm running because I sincerely believe I am the best qualified candidate for the job. I think I can be of real service to my fellow West Virginians by serving on the Supreme Court. Now to add more to that, uh, my first job out of law school was law clerk to the Honorable John A. Field, Jr. He was a judge of the United States Circuit Court of Appeals for the Fourth Circuit. That's one level before the U.S. Supreme Court. Judge Field uh, is one of my heroes. He's the hero of a lot of people that have come into contact with him. And I think like a lot of people, you want to grow up to be like your hero. And he was a judge. So that early on uh, gave me a start. But uh, as a lawyer practicing law for a long time, uh, I'm aware of how the court works. I've dealt with the court on a lot of occasions, and, and I sincerely believe that I have the ideal qualification to serve effectively on the court. And if I may, I'd like to add to that. Sure, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think the Supreme Court, uh, you know, is a scholarly operation. Uh, you know, trial court judges deal with witnesses and uh, objections and factual questions. Uh, the Supreme Court is more scholarly. It, it just reviews uh, written records of, of hearings. It reviews written arguments and briefs. It does listen to oral arguments, but the oral arguments all relate to some proceeding that occurred at a lower level. So it's really more an academic exercise than a trial court. Uh, academically, I, I've got, I'm confident, the most outstanding record of any candidate in Division Two, I was editor-in-chief of the Law Review, uh, graduated at the top of my class, Order of the Court. Uh, so, so I think I have the qualifications, but more important than academics, uh, I, uh, I have a breadth of experience that no other candidate has. Uh, I have been involved in virtually every type of legal proceeding that's possible for a West Virginia lawyer to be involved in. Uh, one of the other candidates uh, is a prosecutor and has been, I believe, a prosecutor. Uh, that's the only job that that candidate has ever had. Well, I spent a uh, few years as a prosecutor and gained a lot of experience there. And in fact, uh, while doing my job as a prosecutor, I convicted uh, a man who is probably West Virginia's most notorious living criminal, a fellow named Ronald Turney Williams. I convicted him of murdering. Actually, police officer David Lilly. Uh, okay. Williams gained his notoriety when he escaped from Moundsville State Penitentiary and murdered off duty state uh, policeman Philip Kessner. Kessner's from up in the Eastern Panhandle. But with those two murders, and then Williams was later uh, arrested in Arizona where he had committed additional murders, he's now serving two life sentences in our state penitentiary. And upon release, he goes to Arizona where he's under sentence of death. Okay, have you have you served on a, a bench position before, or mostly your experience is in like, um, you know, the uh, prosecutor or uh, practicing private law? Well, the experience that gives me the greatest uh, advantage for Supreme Court is all from practicing law, because I've involved in literally every type of legal proceeding that you have that you could do in West Virginia. Now, I, I don't have significant bench experience. I was a municipal judge which gives you a little bit of an insight, but just a taste of it. I think judicial experience is important. I think I gained comparable experience. I served 10 years in the legislature as chairman of the Senate Judiciary Committee. In fact, a, a friend of mine, a, a Republican senator from Tucker County at the time, a lady named Sarah Muneer, observed our committee and said, so Wooten, what you do is really act as a judge. That's what you ought to be. And, and she was right in, in the sense that uh, and, and presiding over that committee for 10 years, you're weighing different issues and you, uh, you, you try to be unbiased and 
and give everyone a fair hearing. But I don't I, have formal experience as a circuit judge. Okay, okay. Regarding like uh, the impeachment proceedings in 2018 at the you know Supreme Court of Appeals or having to do with that, do you think that like the legislature overstepped its authority or it didn't or do you have an opinion on that? Well, I believe that uh, I believe in the separation of powers, and I believe the legislature has the absolute ability to impeach uh, a circuit judge or a Supreme Court justice, or in fact any public official uh, at the state level. And uh, uh, I, I think that there were some significant constitutional infirmities in the procedure followed by the legislature. I think they were pointed out and clearly the uh, legislature could have gone back and corrected those. I don't understand why they made some of the of the errors that were relied upon by the people appealing. Uh, they adopted rules and, and then uh, deviated from their own rules that was pointed out to them in debate and, and the response was, well, it doesn't matter or something to that effect. I you see. Know, I, uh, it, it's yeah. a troubling issue because clearly uh, I believe in the separation of powers. I believe the, the uh, legislature should not involve itself in, in, in setting court procedures. And likewise, I believe the legis the courts should refrain from second guessing legislative procedures. Legislature should govern itself. However, uh, every branch of government is, is subservient to the constitution. And right. if, if any branch deviates in a material way from, from constitutional requirements, it has to be dealt with. Yeah, I noticed like I was looking at the, I was wondering, I kept reading on it and referring to the criminal indictment of the you know key justice so who, who was indicted. So I actually read that, but I was a little surprised to find out that the criminal charges were mostly like kind of like gotcha charges, not to excuse behavior like, you know, he filed an expense report for thirty dollars that he shouldn't have for mileage, and then he mailed it. It's kind of like, I don't know. It seems a lot of there were a lot of technicalities and things. I didn't know quite what to make of it. You know what I mean? It's it's all technical, but you know, mailing something makes you subject to a, a federal crime. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that's a pretty clear answer. You know, on on that issue. Um, about like, you know, the current situation, like with the whole, um, you know, COVID-19 thing, I know it's affected the courts and all other areas. And a lot of governors have, you know, put a lot of restrictions in place. And, and do, do you feel, I mean, do you have anything you can or want to say about that? Like, it seems like it's very un unprecedented. I mean, the kind of things that are happening, I'm not just talking about only West Virginia, but so many states, the great majority of states, it seems like they're, well, already we know there are a lot of cases, but there's just a lot of, um, well, I don't know. It's, it seems like extremely far reaching on somewhat arbitrary, or I don't know if you're free to say, but if you have any kind of general thoughts on it. Well, uh, obviously I do and you do too, and most people do. My concern is that it, it probably already is an issue in a political campaign. And as you know, judicial candidates are not permitted to make a comment on a judicial or on a political campaign, either for or against any candidate. So I, I hate to be evasive, <laughs> but I don't know how I can respond other than- Yeah. Well, sure. Well, that makes some sense. One thing I wanted to ask you about, I saw on the West Virginia court election site, you mentioned that a, a Supreme Court justice must not be dogmatic. A rigid and inflexible pattern of thinking would prevent a justice from grasping new arguments or novel applications of various legal principles. So I'm wondering if you wanted to expand on that. Like, you know, sometimes we hear the term, you know, strictly interpreting the Constitution or strict construction or something like that. And I'm wondering if you want to explain a little more what you meant. Like, are you open to well, you said you're open to novel interpretations. How does that kind of juxtapose with the idea of, you know, strictly following the Constitution? Or am I making sense there? Well, you are, and I can, I can see the reason of the question. Let me tell you what I was trying to get to. I'm a practicing attorney, and I, 
don't mean to be disrespectful to any judges, but there are some judges I've dealt with that have been on the bench, especially a long time, people my age, if you will, uh, and, and they're what I would call dogmatic. They've heard everything, they know everything, and, and, and don't want to listen to you because they've, they've heard everything. And, and sometimes I think as a jurist, you have an obligation to at least listen and consider what someone offers. That's what I was trying to get to in the response you read. Okay, well that that makes sense. That's clear. Would have you ever dealt with someone like that 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 already knows everything? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Who hasn't all the time, especially yeah, if you're yeah. in a political argument or something, or mm -hmm. political or religious, whatever. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah, I, I understand what you're saying. Definitely. Well, kind of on the somewhat the same vein, like, would you care to elaborate, like, on your judicial philosophy in the sense of like you know the constitution interpretation of the constitution i know that it's i'm i don't know it, it may be somewhat limited usefulness but like would you consider yourself like more strictly sticking to the constitution or for instance i was reading one case of, of one of the judges that's running and i saw that he kind of in that case without getting to all the exact details had a somewhat novel interpretation you know so I know different judges or can interpret things in different ways. Would you kind of want to talk about that general topic? Sure. Uh, you know, first off, I believe very strongly in the separation of powers. I think public policy in this state is made by the voters, the citizens, through their elected representatives in the legislature. I think the executive branch carries out those public policies. I think the judicial branch the third branch of our three party or three type of government, the third leg of our triumphant, if you will, uh, its job is not to make public policy and not to execute public policy. I think the judicial branch's job is to ensure that public policy uh, that's uh, embodied in a law is fairly and correctly applied. Uh, correctly, if it says something, that's what you've got to do. Uh, you also, if if constitutional arguments are raised, you have to ensure that uh, the the public policy embodied in the law or the way it was uh, enacted or enforced by the executive branch uh, is is in compliance with the constitution. You can't you cannot deviate from the constitution. But the court does not have the ability to rewrite the constitution. Likewise, it has no ability to rewrite statutes. If, as a justice, I think this was a terrible idea, the legislature should not have done that, well, I can have that as a private opinion, but as a justice, my job is, does it conflict with the Constitution? If not, was it correctly and fairly applied? If so, you uphold. Right, well, that makes sense. That, that, that does make um, you know, sense regarding that. Um, yeah, regarding kind of a more, maybe it's a, a general question, like one um, issue I'm kind of involved with youth education and you know help strengthen families so i'm wondering and this is not exactly a legal question more maybe just philosophical like some communities have like community marriage policies you know different churches will get together and say things like okay you know if you'd like to be married say i know like one of them is like kansas city kansas then you should take some training um, or how do you say, maybe a class or course that we prescribe or we're not going to marry you. It's not to say, you know, they can't go elsewhere to be married, but I think it's just a kind of, um, appar apparently these kind of policies, as far as I know, or they have strengthened, like, reduced divorce is what I'm trying to say. So do you think that kind of approach generally, and again, it's not necessarily a judicial thing, but is that a good approach, bad approach, or do you have any opinion about it? Uh, I have no data for what's to determine if it works or not. I, I think it's, in my judgment, it's clearly the prerogative of the church uh, if they want to do that. And, and if they do that, I, I would hope they would have some some data that would support it. And frankly, I would hope it worked. Yeah. Well, yeah, apparently it has worked, you know, definitely reduced divorce in communities where it's in effect. Mm -hmm. So, you know, th I think that, you know, that's, that's a good thing, you know. Well, and, and in any community, if you don't want to get married in that church, you, you can always have a civil ceremony or, or go to a different church. 
Well, exactly. It's not a legal thing. It's not like telling people, hey, you have to do this. But if, say, most of the churches in the community are doing it, and people, you know, if most people approach a church, which I, I guess is still true in most communities, I think, then, you know, it has an effect on the overall, like, atmosphere or how do you say divorce rate things like that yeah yeah i noticed one other interesting thing on your um one of your interviews i think you were talking about that in the supreme court of appeals like we'll be electing the justices on june 9th but you were suggesting that and it was interesting to me that perhaps if none of those candidates get a majority I mean, this won't happen now, obviously, but this could happen, if, I guess, if the legislature changed, changed it, then there would be a runoff among the uh, candidates, and then more people would be exposed to, I guess, have time to really look at it. Do you want to say anything about that? Well, that, that's really a legislative decision that has to be changed by the legislature. As a citizen, <clears throat> my concern is that, uh, uh, it's very difficult to communicate with people about an election. When you go to vote, you probably, for most people, are interested in the presidential election, uh, then the governor's election. Those are high profile. And then there's a U.S. Senate election this time, and then there are three congressmen running this time. Then you've got your state senators and your House of Delegates members, and there are 100 House seats. So, I mean, that's a lot of people. You go through all that before you even get to the Supreme Court candidate. And we're going to elect in this election a majority of one of three co-equal branches of government. And I, I'm concerned, I'm convinced really, that a lot of people don't have much information about the candidates. I right. think uh, I think when you change the or when the legislature changed the election from partisan to nonpartisan, uh, I, I think they did a disservice in this regard. I think judicial elections have always been nonpartisan. Uh, the code of judicial conduct has always prohibited a judicial candidate from commenting or encouraging or urging anyone to vote for any other candidate in a political race. So it never was partisan. Uh, if you had a, a primary election and then a general election, people would, it would narrow the field, people could focus and gain more information. I think you would have a more informed electorate. Uh, if the legislature believes that there is some merit in making it nonpartisan, I don't quarrel with that. Uh, my, my problem as a citizen, and this is nothing I would do as a judge because I'll not be in a position to make law, but as a citizen, I think if you're going to have a nonpartisan election you, uh, and have it in May when, in fact, more people turn out to vote in November than they do in the primary. Uh, so what I would recommend is if we're going to have nonpartisan in May, if anyone gets 50%, they're elected. But if not, the top two vote getters are on the ballot in, in November. And at least people have more opportunity to gain information. That, I that's right. Thinking. I think uh, one of the reasons we're doing these interviews, although we're doing other positions too, obviously, is that, you know, to let people, you know, know more about the candidates. And I agree. I mean, probably a lot of people don't realize, or the majority, that we're electing, what is it? The term is 10 years, is it? 12 years. 12 years. 12. So two 12-year terms and a, and also the un, un uh, what do you that's say? That's about a four. Yeah, unexpired term. Well, I mean, that's huge. And, and since we have three, you're absolutely right, that don't realize the gravity of it. So I would uh, agree with you on, you know, that issue, definitely. Um, well, looking, uh, you know, coming maybe a little toward the close, like looking at the fact you, ha you have, you know, um, three other, how do you say, opponents, how would you differentiate yourself versus the other opponents? Would you like care to uh, say about that? Well, I'm the only veteran in the race. Uh, I'm the only uh, person in the race <clears throat> who's not on a public payroll. Uh, I have more experience in more different areas of the law than any of the other candidates. Uh, one candidate's ex experience is exclusively as a prosecutor. I've done that, but there's a whole lot more to the law than just being a prosecutor. Another candidate's focus is uh, 
overwhelmingly in the area of domestic relations. I've done just about every type of domestic relations case you can do, uh, but there's a whole lot of the law that's beyond domestic relations. Another candidate's uh, practical experience as a lawyer is insurance defense work. I've done a little bit of that, mostly been on the other side, but uh, there's a lot more to the law than, than just that. Now, to her credit, as circuit judge, she's been exposed to, you know, to other areas, but, uh, you, you know, I've, I've done every possible thing that a lawyer in West Virginia can do. I think that breadth uh, of experience is what really distinguishes me from the other candidates. Okay. All right. Well, that, I think that's a good summation, unless if there's anything else you'd like to share. We'll pray, you know, that's a, a good good conclusion there. Any other uh, thoughts you have, closing thoughts? Well, one, I want to thank you for this opportunity and to commend you on your preparation. I didn't realize you'd read all those questionnaires. That, I'm impressed. <laughs> I don't know if I read all of them, <laughs> at least some of them. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you for joining us uh, today. And I, I am your host, Richard Urban, coming from Stork Harpers Ferry. Do be sure to vote June 9th. As you've been saying, that is the actual election. And, you know, the three, three of uh, our Supreme Court justices will be elected. Election's June 9th, as you said, but you can vote early now, between now and June 6th. Okay. All right. A fitting uh, note. That's right. You can uh, vote early. So, yeah, thank you again for joining us. We'll see you next time.